So we're back. Um, this is why we went into healthcare and not into acting or, um, or media services. <laughs> so we've had a little interruption in our Facebook live streaming. I'm Joanne Conroy. I'm CEO and president of Dartmouth-Hitchcock and Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health. And I have with me Kara Majewski, director of the Office of Patient Experience here. I know a number of you probably signed in early on, but we're going to repeat the patient's story that Carol shared with me because it's really important for the rest of our conversation, which is going to be about patient experience. So Carol, um, take two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joanne. Um, so this story happened probably about a, a probably about two years ago to my husband and I, and uh, it occurred on a Friday and uh, we had an 11 week old that uh, began to seize. And uh, my husband is not in healthcare as I am, and he called me at work and said, we've got a problem. And, and through the course of the afternoon, we learned that the best place for, for the 11 week old to be cared for was about three hours away. And we made what would be an incredibly nerve wracking journey and arrived there to have the first person we saw say, you must be the Majewskis. We've got a team waiting for you. And I felt, I felt such a sense of relief. And then through that evening, um, the provider interacted with us a number of times and, and everyone introduced themselves by name and by role, spoke to us, you know, addressing us by name. And the provider sat down and he spoke with us and he says, tell me the story of what happened today. Um, and just listened without a computer, without just going through questions, but listened to us share the story. And then after an assessment and evaluation came back out and shared a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And even as a nurse, I found some of it overwhelming. And when he finished, he looked at both of us and he says, what's worrying you most right now? And that was such a moment because I was able to get the lump out of my throat and say, well, is he going to live? And, and once I was able to ask that and the provider was offered some reassurances, I was then able to ask the other questions. Um, and that's very unusual. We, we typically just say, what questions do you have? And we expect <clears throat> people to come up with intelligent questions in a very emotional moment. And throughout the next three or four days, everyone that interacted with us, um, the courtesy, the kindness, the compassion, the acknowledgement of our emotions, this must feel overwhelming, scary, um, even just recognizing exhaustion, you yeah. look tired, and don't worry, we're going to be right here by his side so you can get a little rest. Wasn't scripted, it was genuine and authentic. Um, it was just consistently, we felt a sense of, of caring and compassion. And even as we kind of came to the end of our, our first day with them, um, there was an error that occurred. Mm -hmm. And the way they immediately said, oh my goodness, um, acknowledged that could make us anxious, got a provider, uh, fixed it, apologized for it, and then told us how they were, were going to take care of it so it wouldn't happen to someone else. Yeah. It was such a, you know, even with an error, I knew I would be back there yeah. for all that had gone well and all they had done. Um, Just a combination of incredible expertise, but also understanding that trust and transparency and just respect oh. was, they were just as important as knowing what was the right diagnosis. Yes. It was communicating effectively with the family. And it was caring. I felt cared for there yeah. in ways that, um, that just amazed me. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a punchline though to yes. that. Yes. So the 11 week old was our uh, French Mastiff puppy. And um, so we had never had a dog with seizures before. And so um, as we were experiencing this there, I really, I took the time to sit down and start to write it down because I said, this, this is what patients and families want. Yeah. What we were getting was what I would want any member of my family to get. Yeah. Um, and I spoke with them about that and, and I asked, I said, you know, how do you do this? And they really talked about how they, they connect because all of them have pets. They yeah. have dogs and they have cats and, and they remember and know what it's like to, yeah. to be afraid and to worry. Yeah. You know, that's a good point. As we um, start to talk about creating the optimum patient experience here, <clears throat> we probably don't use family members' names enough and ask them how they'd like to be addressed. 
And you're right. You know, if you were to enter the unit and somebody would say hello to you know, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith would feel a little bit more cared for. And welcomed. And welcomed. Yes. And that's actually not part of what we ask people to do every day. Although maybe it is now, Carol, because <laughs> you're kind of moving us. We're moving there. <laughs> so how are you taking what you've kind of learned from that experience and what pieces are you trying to integrate into how we actually train our own employees? And it's not just the clinical staff, it's everybody that would right. interact with patients. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I think to, to what were the important elements of that, um, it was the respect. You know, we, we felt very respected. It was being understood and, and understanding. And I talk with, with our teams a lot about that. Our patients want to understand us. They mm -hmm. want to. And, and you see that in their feedback um, when they say that somebody explained something in a way that they could understand. We slip into medicalese very easily. It's, it's yeah. the second language I speak almost as fluently as English. And, and helping people recognize that Patients really want to understand. Also, they want to be heard. Mm -hmm. They want to be listened to us. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that provider saying, just tell me your story. Yeah. Um, patients will comment, I felt listened to. Yeah. So, you know, how do I share that with people? That How do we listen? Yeah. How do we make sure and, and check our language and our acronyms and those things at the door? Yeah. Um, patients want to feel safe. How do we make and create an environment where they feel safe to say things that perhaps are uncomfortable. Maybe to say, you know what, doctor, I didn't follow that diet. Yeah. Or I haven't been taking that prescription the way you, you wanted me, me to. to. Yeah. Um, and, and have them feel okay to do that because we've built that trust and that relationship. So those are the, the key and critical things. I say it's not the what we do, but it's the how we do yeah. it. You know, there are some providers that would say, we actually did do that a little bit more in the past yes. and probably lost some of that. I did um, have a chairman of anesthesia when I was in South Carolina that would always say, when you come into a room, sit down. Yes. Don't stand up. Absolutely. Sit down. Because if you just stand up, people wondering, are wondering when you're going to bolt out of the room. <laughs> and if you sit down, you've made a commitment to actually listening to that patient. Yes. And um, I have to say, and all the histories that I've taken, patients do a pretty good job of telling a story that allows you to make a pretty accurate diagnosis before you even put a stethoscope on their chest. So the story that a patient shares with you is actually really important. I absolutely agree with that. Talk a little bit more about, um, about actually um, using people's names because that is something that we want to do for all employees, you know, right. welcome each other. But we probably need to think about how do we do that for patients and their families as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, your name is who you are. And when you think about, uh, first of all, while my title is patient experience, there is nobody that wants a patient experience. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. It's why we're dieting and exercising to avoid patient experiences. Right. What people really want are personal experiences. Mm -hmm. They want that connection. And so when we're connecting by name and we're getting to know somebody for who they are and seeing them for who they are mm -hmm. and not for a diagnosis, yeah. it recognizes that individuality. It creates that connection and that relationship. We don't have a relationship with a left total knee. Yeah. We have yeah. a relationship with a gentleman who is an avid cyclist and wants his knee done so he can be back out on his bike. Right, right. And so names are a way of reminding us that we're connecting with people. Yeah. So you've been here for three years in this role. In this role, yes. You've been here for longer than that. I have 16 <laughs> years. <laughs> so what did you, what was your role before you went into patient experience? I led perioperative services. So I was in the, the kind of high tech world of uh, the operating room, uh -huh. same day surgery, recovery area and all. Now, why did you move into this role? Uh, well, I had the opportunity to go back to school, which was mm -hmm. uh, an incredible gift. And as I looked at kind of my career and what mm -hmm. I had done and, and looked back at my appraisals and everything, patient advocacy was an area that I, I was particularly strong in. But I also had a family experience where I was able to um, uh, kind of partner with my father-in-law for his care here at Dartmouth mm -hmm. when he was undergoing care for cancer. And it was during that time that I think um, 
I was offered a different lens. I mm -hmm. started in the role thinking that I was going as his navigator and translator. I'll just, you know, right. kind of help him cruise through this process. And instead, as, as I sat through appointments and observed things and all, I began to really see it differently mm -hmm. and begin to appreciate it from kind of the patient side and, and all yeah. and say, wow, there's an opportunity for us to, to really shift this and move it in a way um, that will make a difference in their experience and also in their outcomes. Yeah. What was your aha moment? Because there's always one, like what one experience did you participate in with him? I think it was um, the day that things weren't going well. Mm -hmm. uh, his appointment was later in the day than he expected it. So by the time he got here, there was a challenge parking. And then um, whoever had to draw his blood, his favorite person wasn't there. And then the provider ran late. So we probably had a number of things that just kind of was like the Swiss cheese of, of not going well. Right. But the appointment was good. The results were good. And as we walked out from the hallway, this nurse came out and she recognized him. And she said, oh my goodness, Fred, you know, it's been so long since I've seen you. And she kind of joked because she used to give him an injection. She goes, you're cheating on me and getting your shots from another nurse. And, and she said, how's your dog? And how's your garden? And he grinned and his blue eyes sparkled and he joked with her. And, yeah. and this was probably a 90 second interaction yeah. in a two hour visit. And yet that was the story he told when he shared at home with all his retired friends and family, when he talked with everybody about his appointment, he talked about how much Dartmouth cared. Yeah. And Dartmouth cared was in 90 seconds, and yeah. it was just her connecting with him as a person. Yeah. And I thought, things will go wrong, and there are going to be little glitches in our days because we're dealing with people. But people don't recognize you can make, in 90 seconds, you can turn a day around, and you can yeah. make their experience and their story. Yeah, it's great. You know, it, something else that you said actually reminded me that we probably have to make sure our employees kind of dig back into their own experiences and the experiences they may have had with family members. Almost, you know, they used to make young physicians in training actually be a patient for a day. Like That's a be, great idea. Like be in a bed and yep. be transported down the hall and have everybody looking down on you. And, Wear that, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it actually creates... Uh, opportunity for you to kind of uh, be present. And I think when you reflect on your own family's experiences, and we all have them, it probably bring a better person to that interaction with the patient. Absolutely. So, you, you, you connect with your heart in yeah. ways that, um, that break down those barriers and allow you to, to really connect with that person and have them feel very yeah. much like you're a person caring for them. Now, you've been in the role for three years, so yes. what would you say have been kind of, when you look back, you say, okay, that was a good accomplishment. And then what do you want to achieve over the next couple of years? Well, I would tell you that some people would tell me the greatest accomplishment was getting the maps at the elevators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I would share that I think it's the fact we're having the conversations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got some awareness. We've been we've been sharing data. We've mm -hmm. been sharing stories. You know, mm -hmm. we're getting the stories out there. We're letting teams and providers know what our patients are telling us, mm -hmm. the comments, the, the things that they do. Um, we've got patients at the table. We've mm -hmm. got patient and family advisors as part of our committees and our work. Um, and now what I think is, is happening is people are calling saying, how do we make this better, Carol? How can we, how can we improve this? What are patients looking for? Yeah. So we've got the right conversations happening, and we've got some interest in doing it. Yeah. So talk a little bit about your patient and family advisory council. It's actually pretty big. Yes. And you have a lot of subgroups, too, focusing on the individual areas. We do. So we have a number of patient and family advisors who, who help us in, a, in various ways. So we have some who volunteer and actually go and, um, and talk with patients while they're in patients and ask them just an open-ended, how's it going? And they're able to get information in a way that perhaps you know a, st a nurse or, or another person couldn't because yeah. they're they're very unassuming and, and just there to listen. We have patient and family advisors who sit on committees and task force, mm -hmm. and um, they're part of the decision making. Yeah. They're not just there to to give us an opinion; they help us decide what to do. Yeah. And then we have some that help us with our new nurses and our new residents, really helping them reconnect with the part of them that really um, wants to offer personal yeah. experience to our patients and families. So we've got a great group. Great. 
Now, I do have a question from the audience. How are you addressing telephone communications with patients? So this could have two different answers. Let's take the first one, which I think is probably the reason why it was asked in terms of how we interact with patients on phones. Right. Voicemail, <laughs> phone press screens, one for yes, this, yes, press we, two for that. Yes, we, we all hate those. So right. um, how are we looking at that? Uh, we're doing a number of things. First, we know that we have, patients have a number of different preferences to communicate. Mm -hmm. Some people want to talk with that person, mm -hmm. and we have other people that would be perfectly happy if they could text everything to us and never talk to us. Right. So it's how do we create strategies um, that will work, that we can individualize for people. Mm -hmm. We are working to um, standardize our phone trees to make it easier for people to know that each and every time you do one, you're going to get this or two. Right. So um, there's not as much variation okay. that we've had in the past. We're looking at how we can uh, reduce you know, telephone calls and mm -hmm. help people use MyDH as a means yeah. to communicate. So uh, offering an electronic way to connect um, for patients who don't necessarily need immediate service um, and to create uh, within certain clinics or high volume areas, you know, the resources and the ways that allow people to not only either make that phone call, but to get that return call in the time frame they'd like it. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many things that companies are using. I know that they say, you know, press a button if you want us to return your call to exactly. the number you're calling from, which is actually quite convenient. And mm -hmm. they're, they're actually pretty effective in calling back in a certain period of time. So, and one question, I have a 93-year-old mom who um, is a little bit hard of hearing. So what do we do for hard of hearing individuals? Because my mom, I'm not sure she would get on a MyDH and type a question, right. but she might. But I think she likes to talk to somebody. She likes to talk. And we do have some technology. Our um, care management office actually has a whole team that have various technological solutions that mm -hmm. we can bring to the inpatient or the outpatient setting to okay. help patients. Um, because we know that sometimes a patient... Uh, forgets their hearing aids or yeah. doesn't have batteries and and the clinics can immediately place a call and we can bring in something to help amplify the sound in that environment okay. and allow for effective communication. Great. Um, what roles are available that are part of care teams at Dartmouth-Hitchcock? Um, my assumption is this is patient and family advisory roles that right. are part of care teams. So okay. how do you integrate them into the care team? Oh, it's ever changing. So we get requests from lots of different groups. So what we look for is where's that connection? What is the individual that's volunteering interested in being a part mm -hmm. of or what expertise or passions do they bring? Yeah, the pediatrics team is like incredible. Oh, exactly. So. Um, but we have other teams that are interested in qualities. We've got people on the cancer yeah. group. So it's what do they have a passion for and interest yeah. in? And then how can we put them in a place where that is, where it's going to you know, be a value to them and exciting yeah. to them and also be a benefit to us. So we want it to be a real match. And yeah. so we take time to really sit down and talk with them about, you know, their stories, what, mm -hmm. what brings, you know, what brings a passion to them and then connect them with the right group. So it's so a lot of work. One question, um, you know, a lot of times historically people put patients on advisory councils if they had beef with the hospital. Mm -hmm. And... I'm not sure that's what you're looking for right now. What is the skill set that you're looking for on somebody you want to put in, a, arguably, a position that could change the course of the organization? Right. We're looking for individuals who have had interactions with Dartmouth-Hitchcock and can speak to the things that we do well and to the things that haven't gone as well. Um, we want somebody who's willing to just listen and take in the mm -hmm. whole experience because the whole purpose is for all of us to understand and look through the sit at the situation mm -hmm. through each other's lenses. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like walking in someone else's shoes. What is it like to be the nurse? What's it like to be the patient or the provider yeah. or anybody else that's a part of that experience? Mm -hmm. And then to offer suggestions that are not based solely on their own experience, but on a broader base. So somebody that's connected with their community, that mm -hmm. talks with others about care and what they'd like to see, um, can really bring robust opinions to, to the dialogue and to the decisions. Yeah. So... I'm sure they've come up with some great ideas. So talk about a few of the great ideas that have come from patient family advisory councils. 
Oh my goodness. We've done some things, um, uh, Children's Hospital, uh, Chad, some of the renovation work has been based on their feedback. We've made changes in the, uh, just in the menu and what's available for, for children, even mm -hmm. going to the um, kind of the full-time kind of uh, room service model mm -hmm. for certain units and all based on, on patient and family advisor feedback mm -hmm. and the work that they're doing to hear our patients. Uh, we've done things on the birthing pavilion around um, partner meals mm -hmm. down on the One West unit. Um, oh my, there's so many things that are coming yeah. across uh, right down to the, the golf cart in the parking lot. I was going to say parking. Oh, parking. <laughs> um, you know, that was certainly feedback that we heard and we did a demo last year. And right now we're still waiting for the one that we ordered. So yeah. the golf cart's been ordered and it's just when's it going to get here. So maybe talk to the group. It's almost 1230. So we probably need to end. But I think people would want to know maybe a little bit about the golf cart. How are you thinking about using it? So when we demoed it uh, last summer, what we found is that we had a golf cart with a member of our hospital team, some of our leaders, as well as our security team driving it. And we just went out and picked up patients and families um, right in the, the main uh, lot area and brought them to the door and back out. And what we found is that many patients and families are willing, like they would drop somebody off at the door because they felt like they didn't want them to walk at all, but they really wanted to park their own car. They didn't mm -hmm. necessarily want somebody to park their car for them, but really appreciated the fact that the golf cart made it easy for them to park their own car mm -hmm. and then have them right back up at our entrance in no time. Certainly in the inclement weather, it was a welcome little uh, shortened the, the walking trip. Mm -hmm. But we do have patients and families who park further away and enjoy the walk yeah. and say, yeah. you know, I need the fresh air and the walk. So it was a way for them to politely be able to say, I'm good, go on, or yeah. to hop on the cart and, um, and to share their story. They yeah. really enjoyed interacting with uh, members of the DH team who drove yeah. the cart. Great. Great. Well, I do have a golf cart in Maine, so I'm golf cart <laughs> certified. <laughs> then we'll see you out there. <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank everybody for um, spending the time with us. I'm Joanne Conroy, again, President and CEO of Dartmouth-Hitchcock, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health, talking about patient experience with Carol Majewski, our Director of the Office of Patient Experience. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful week.